Okay. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Drawing Us In, a conversation about contemporary drawing. Um, it is two o'clock here um, in Miami, Florida, and we're about to get started with this um, conversation. I have four of my panelists here with me right now, and another panelist will be joining us from the West Coast of the US in just a few moments. Thank you um, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jennifer Prince. I'll be on your screen as the Bakehouse Art Complex. Um, and I have a little bit of information to share with you um, as we get started. So I'm going to share my screen. wrong screen. <laughs> it's taking a moment to load. And I love the beauty of technology. This was working perfectly during my practice run. And now it is taking its time. Um, while this is loading, I will let you know that um, this event is sponsored today um, and it's part of the virtual programming of the Bakehouse Arts Complex. And is a continuation of their focus on collaboration, learning and inspiration for artists um, and the general public. And this is just, okay, let's, we were just, I was just saying that I was not a great IT person. And now it's proving to be the case. Aha. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you, yeah. <laughs> uh, my apologies, I don't know what happened. Everything just went blank. All right, so one last try. All right. Okay. All right. So this program is supported and part of the current virtual programming of the Bakehouse Arts Complex. The Bakehouse is a studio home to more than 100 working artists in the urban core of Miami, Florida. It builds community, facilitates creative exchange, and provides the opportunity for artists to collaborate, learn from, inspire, and encourage each other while also informing and educating the public about the power of art. This series of online programming is the Bakehouse's way of continuing that mission during our COVID, current COVID-19 situation. And I wanted to share with you a couple of other upcoming events that the Bakehouse is sponsoring. On Thursday, April 16th, there's a serious launch at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Aesthetics of Mobility, Visibility, and the Poetics of Living. Bakehouse artists and partners, Naja Moon and Giovanna Gonzalez, 
will launch a new conversation series taking place in their mobile project space, Living Life as Practice. On Tuesday, April 21, from 6 to 7.30 p.m., we'll hear dispatches from Anderson Ranch as four Bakehouse artists talk about their recent experiences at the Anderson Ranch Arts Center through the ULITES Home Away program. And then the first Saturdays of April, May, and June, there's a podcast, Body Visions, a meditation series to help us cope with these stressful times um, Bakehouse is presenting a monthly guided meditation series led by artist Nicole Sausalito titled Body Visions. To find out more, uh, please visit the Bakehouse website, bacfl.org. Um, and just for a little bit of housekeeping, um, we've structured this as a webinar um, with the hopes of having lots of viewers. So please use the question and answer uh, function that you should see at the top of your box um, or the top of your screen um, to ask any questions um, directly to the panelists. And you should also be able to use the chat function um, also there on your screen. Okay. Um, so today's conversation grew out of our current global situation. The artists speaking today are part of a group of 14 artists from around the globe selected to participate in the Lairs Drawing Research Residency in Paris for the last two weeks of August 2020. Lair, and that's spelled L apostrophe A-I-R, is a residency program with a focus on intercultural exchange, research, and professional development founded by Myla Ochinovic in 2016. And Myla, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Founded in France, La Air is the French version of artist in residence. It can also be read as Lair, as the artist's Lair, or a studio where the artist lives, works, and develops ideas. A space and time designed to support the creative process. The curated program for the drawing research residency was designed to enable participants to study drawing in the historical and contemporary context of Paris, to participate in professional visits to contemporary art institutions and fairs, including Drawing Now, Salon de Dessin, and Drawing Lab Paris. Days before the scheduled start of their program, the COVID-19 pandemic grew in its severity across Europe and then the world, ultimately postponing the program and leading to shelter at home orders for many of the countries in which these artists live. Undeterred, we started using social media to interact and develop relationships with each other. Conversations began that started our mutual concerns um, about the pace of COVID-19 in our home countries, then developed into ways with which we could collaborate, actions that wholeheartedly reflected the goals Mila set for the LAIR programs. This conversation brings together a subset of these artists. Um, and unfortunately, there were others who wanted to join us, but it's almost impossible to find a time that accommodates artists from Australia to New York. I will be sharing a few images supplied by artists who wanted to be here but could not due to time or work while I'll be speaking in the next few moments. Today, we'll discuss what drawing means how we personally use the meeting medium for our own artistic goals and how we have continued creating in this unprecedented situation. Defining drawing reveals that drawing is a bit duplicitous. The word in English can be either a verb or a noun, an object or an action. As an object, drawing has a long history of being considered a preliminary process to a completed work, but has finally been accepted in its own right as a powerful standalone medium, an acceptance that has either allowed or coincided with an expansion of the media. Drawing as an object has gone from being bound to paper to existing on a multitude of surfaces. This change has allowed drawings to grow an enormous scale and move into more sculptural or installation situations. To complete the action or to make the object, a tool is needed, 
And contemporary artists work across a range of media, selecting or even making the tools that fit their approach. The ubiquitous graphite pencil is still being used, but it is alongside digital applications and handmade instruments. Defining drawing as a verb opens it up to a wide range of practices and methodologies. Classically, drawing has been rooted in mimesis, the capturing of the naturalized likeness of an object, person, or arrangement. And many artists continue to work in this manner with notable and amazing results, showing vantages and viewpoints we may look over or should consider with greater depth. Key to this action of drawing is the act of seeing, and some contemporary drawers have changed the viewpoint of drawing from that of observing the outside world to an observing of the interior world of the artist, thus presenting drawing as a recording of their emotive and spiritual states. A process which often calls for a visual language that deals with abstraction and hybridization to express visceral and nonverbal phenomena. The idea of seeing has also been flipped in other ways, as many contemporary artists make drawing into a performative act, initiated and completed in front of an audience, live or insinuated by the camera, thus allowing viewers to see the typically hidden process and giving the process as much, if not more, importance than the end product. Our panelists today are artists who work in drawing and are spread across the extremes of two continents. Their work reflects a broad range of conceptual ideologies and methodologies. And I've asked in our conversation today for them to share about their work and in doing so define what drawing means to them. So again, welcome everyone to Drawing Us In. So the first thing I thought we would do um, is for each of the panelists to do a quick introduction of are, where they're currently stationed, um, and then we'll, later we'll open the conversation up. So if one of you guys want to jump in. Uh, I can start. I'm uh, Yen Hogg, and I was in New York. I'm Hannah Stuhulik, and I'm in Los Angeles. Awesome. I'm Grazielli, uh, and I'm based in Lisbon. I'm Ole Leibach. I'm based in Denmark. I'm Nicole Schimanek. I'm based in Winnipeg, Canada. Awesome. So as we get started, could one of you jump in um, to that first question and describing your work and your practice a little bit to us? Yen, since you started with the introduction, <laughs> do you? Do you Sorry, want I'm letting my professor come out. That's okay. You should just call on us because otherwise we, we just might not answer. Uh, do you want us to share images and talk about a little bit what we're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me share my screen. Where did I put my? And while you're pulling that up, I'll just send the reminder that if people want to um, ask questions, please use the question and answer box. Does this show up on your screen? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, let me do the whole preview then. Um, so I only draw, I, uh, that's the only type of art that I do. Um, and I do, I draw mostly with paint markers or pens this whole series is a series that I've been working on for a while called uh, She Is series, and it's sort of a combination of, well, it's not a combination, it's um, drawings that reflect man-made objects at the same time that it incorporates natural elements. So really when I'm drawing them, I'm thinking about the multifaceted nature of women and how, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that are hidden or not so hidden about the female mystique. And that's kind of what comes out in this series of drawings. This one is specifically for the new year. So there is, I'm starting to weave in um, written elements, which I've not tried before. 
so these two are a pair. Let me see. Can I do that? Oh, yeah. Um, for the new year, uh, the lunar new year. So you'll see there's pieces of rats for year of the rat and chrysanthemums and all sorts of. Yin, I hate to interrupt, um, but it seems like we're seeing your finder and not the large image. Uh, how do I? Wait, let me stop my share and try from a different screen because I think that's what's happening. And we'll just be flexible today, everyone. Technology, oh. it's the best of us sometimes. <laughs> Desktop two. Okay, are you seeing now the images? I'm seeing your finder screen. Damn it! <laughs> I'm sure, can, you, can, you, can you pull? Uh, <laughs> we're, we're being told from our, our listeners that we're doing great. <laughs> okay. I That's wonder good. If, if you could pull the image over. Um, it, I have two desktops open, and I'm not sure which one that is working. And so when it gives me, oh, fi, let me try files. OK, I'm just going to go through the files. No, that's not going to work. Share screen. Yeah, one person is suggesting maybe double click. There we go. OK. Um, so this is the series of images that's part of the Shia series, which was made for the Lunar New Year. Um, let me see if I can get my other ones for you. The what's I find that what's been happening. I mean, now that we're all sheltered at home, I haven't I I have I don't have a studio space anymore. So the the ability to make larger works has been kind of limiting. So this is a series that I was working on before. Okay. These are landscape series that I was working on um, in a studio at a residency in Mass Mocha. And this is what I had intended to be working on when I got back from Paris, basically. So right now it's a series of five panels that are like this. And then this is the full series together. Does that show? I'm still seeing the red image. Ah, closing that. Oh, there ah. ah, perfect, beautiful. <laughs> okay. So this is a larger series of work that I had been plan planning to work on um, before before we all got sheltered in place. So. Um, now, I'll show you what I'm working on currently, if I can. So these are drawings that I can do from my dining room table, which is my current workspace. Um, the series started here, and it's moving through a bit of a reflection on uh, social spaces and just the how my pen strokes are relating because I can't sit down in one uh, time frame to do this. So it's in between work related things, feeding the kids, you know, dinners. And so uh, I'm just playing around with how that kind of takes shape over time. So that's kind of the work that I'm doing. Could you tell us a little bit, some questions came in um, about your materials and what you use? Yeah, I use a pen. This is a Sharpie, actually. And now I've gone through about four or five Sharpies. So you can see like where there's a lightness and a darkness is sometimes it starts to run out of ink and then I have to find a new one. Um, I use also uh, pen, pen touch gold pens. And I had another series, I just, I use whatever kind of pens I have around. I like Sharpies a lot. I have a lot of those. Um, and are all of these on paper, Yen, or? They're all on paper. Mm -hmm. Should I stop the share and somebody else can share? 
Sure. Uh, and uh, one comment that just came in, which we can spend some more time on now or later, is that um, the reality that artists now are having to deal with the quote unquote domestic distractions of <laughs> kids um, working from home, and that uh, can be a little tricky some. Yeah, it's really strange actually for uh, what I find the hardest thing to do about working from home is the, the mental aspect of going in and coming back out of the artwork. So I've been only finding pieces, I'll actually share something that I have been working on. Um, and I've made quite a lot of these because I find them very uh, meditative. Let me see. And then share screen. It's the clip here, yeah. Are you seeing a clip of my hands? Yes. Okay. Uh, so go. this is, yeah. So because this is a time, I've been making time lapse drawings. And so it takes anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour to make the whole drawing. And when I start, I tell everybody, you can't disturb me because after I can't stop I can't pause the camera at all so once I start I'm really fully in that moment and so I've been trying to do that at least once a day and the whole family knows now that if they see my setup that they're not allowed to, I'm not going to talk to them I can talk to them I'm not going to do anything else like get dinner or anything so what I'm seeing and hearing from you is that you're sort of creating a boundary around your practice that in doing this as a time lapse, you're saying, once my camera is started, no interferences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a limited time. So also it's not as if I'm saying, never come back to me again. I'm just saying, I just need to finish this drawing. So when I'm done with it, then I can talk to you. So that's one of the ways that I'm trying to make a little bit of space while having, I have two kids and a husband and so just trying to find my, carve out my own place for, for making. And how large are these, Yen? These are small. These are all, uh, I think, like eight and a half by 11-ish, you know, like a paper size. Okay. And then another question, um, and that's what I'm doing, building the question. <laughs> okay, good, because I can't do both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the, one of the questions that came up was how, what do you use to mount your camera or assuming that you're using your iPhone for this? I am using my iPhone and I have, I don't know where I put it. Oh, it's right behind me. I'll show you since we can do that. I have a tripod set up like this. Ah, okay. Yeah. Great. And it has a little thing where I just slip my thing in, my, but also What's really fun about it is once I put it all in, I my I can't actually answer text messages or phone calls or so it'll be there recording and then I'll hear people texting me, but I, but it's too bad I can, there's nothing I can do. Awesome. So it's enforced meditation, meditative drawing. <laughs> do you do any uh, preliminary sketches in advance, or do you just jump in and see where the um, the drawing leads you? I usually just jump in and see what happens. Cool. Yeah, they're all they're all pretty. Uh, they're not all similar. They all have different mm -hmm. colorings and shapes and yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Should any questions from our panelists? We can also you could also jump in and ask questions if you like of Yen or each other. Um, or we could just keep moving. So Hannah, um, since you were second to say hello, can you share? <laughs> sure. Um, so my work and all right, I, um, I'll share my screen. I just pulled up my art Instagram because that seems to be the thing that I'm currently um, updating the most besides my website. So I'm going to show that screen here um, so you can get an idea of some of the work that I do. So um, 
I mainly work with drawings of the body. Um, I am a yoga teacher as well as an artist, so I'm constantly interested in the interiors of people. And, um, you know, I think figurative art is interesting, but um, I think there's a lot of skin that's shown and I'm kind of interested in showing what's beyond that. So um, this is kind of a few pieces of work here that I've done. Um, these are kind of some of the works that I used for submitting. So you can see that I do a lot of pen work. I do um, silver pointing as well. So that's what these lighter ones are made with. Um, so using um, ground on paper and then using a metal point. So this is made with silver. You can do like gold or other points too. Um, and then you can see too, I've gone through different like series of abstractions within the body of, you know, um, taking, let's see, there's a lot of different things on here. <laughs> um, let's see, I can get to one of my more recent ones. Um, here's some fun sketches in my sketchbook. Uh, I've been playing around with doing some oil painting as well. So I do like to oil paint. Um, and so I've done like the Van Gogh uh, skull. That was kind of a fun one I did. Um, I did another few bone paintings here, you can see. Um, so the subject's always the same. I'm always kind of trying to figure out how to approach it a little bit differently. So maybe the content is a little more abstracted. Maybe I'm uh, exploring with blending different materials together. Um, so yeah, it's always kind of, you know, little iterations on a similar idea. And the other thing that I just finished recently was um, a silver, oh wait, this isn't the finished one, hang on. <laughs> it's a silver point piece and I did it on blue paper. So I actually used, um, I used watercolor pigment along with the ground and then I had this really neat kind of bluish tone to it. Um, and it's a picture of a skull that I did with the um, silver point on it, so. It's kind of my most recent one. And uh, I actually didn't think I was gonna finish it before our residency. And then it turned out that we didn't go. So then I was like, I have no excuses. I have to finish this now. Uh, so <laughs> Hannah, right? yeah. yeah, I have a couple <laughs> of questions. Can you, sure. can you describe for us um, what you mean by silver point drawing? And then um, talk about any references you might use for these anatomical pieces. Sure. So I'll flip back here. Um, silver point is, well, I can grab it for you because my studio is in here anyways. Um, <laughs> and I was just cleaning yesterday, you know, so. That Basically, is one of the advantages of this situation. <laughs> I know, I'm trying to get my life somewhat organized, you know. Um, ah, here we go. So basically I'll use a paper or I can use a panel or whatever I really want to draw on. Um, and silver point ground. Um, traditionally, it was made with like just, you can use gesso too. Um, so you can use silver point ground or gesso. Golden has a great material here. And um, just basically that, and I have this, it looks like a mechanical pencil, but inside of it is actually um, silver. So, ah, here's my camera. So it doesn't look like much, but the neat thing is that um, the drawings have a nice little sheen to them. And uh, over time, they actually patina. So it will change as the drawing is finished. And, you can notice that, especially when I don't work on it for a while, and then I go back into it, and it's like you can tell where I stopped and started. Uh, so I think of silver point as a drawing process, specifically from the Renaissance. Is that part of what gravitated you towards it? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, like a lot of the anatomy and art and science kind of moving all together was in the Renaissance. And uh, I teach medical illustration. So I talk about this period a lot with my students. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of a time when, you know, artists and science are all working together and materials like this were actually more of like a preliminary step towards like a painting. Um, but, and as and I do like to paint, but I really find drawing um, to be more interesting you know um it, it can be its own thing on itself you don't need to paint you can just have the drawing you know <laughs> so yeah <laughs> great and then um could you tell us a little bit um about the references you use are you working from real bones or books or from your imagination or a little bit of the above 
Um, unfortunately, I don't have any real bones. That's something I would like in the future, but I think I just need, my partner needs to get a little more on board with it before the house is <laughs> like a, you know, museum case here. Um, but I do use a lot of references. I have a lot of old textbooks that I've referenced. Um, and I have uh, a lot of images I get from the internet. You know, I was doing a lot of like microscope slides for a while that I was getting my image references from. So I was just going on a lot of different like medical websites and just kind of, you know, making my own resources. The internet's amazing for, you know, finding whatever it is that's in your brain. And then you can kind of manifest it your own way on the paper. Cool. And then one more question that I'm mm -hmm. curious about. Does yeah. your teaching of yoga and your teaching of anatomy influence your work and how? Yes. Um, I think the yoga brings actually a little more of like a spiritual side to my drawings of, you know, looking at beauty within and possibilities that maybe feel untapped. Um, and you can, you know, I try to let my students see that in their practices. And I feel like I'm doing that when I am drawing such an intricate part of our body, you know, transformed into this beautiful work of art of something that we would see and maybe not think of it that way. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I, I take my role as a teacher. Um, it informs my art a lot, you know? So um, every time that I teach, I'm constantly inspired by my students and what they produce and what they make. And so I definitely see that as influencing me as well. Cool. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any other questions for Hannah? As I'm seeing things come up in the question section and chat, um, I'm trying to pass those along. So feel free to continue to do that, everyone. There, Grazia had a question that I was also curious about. Are the drawings actual anatomy or are they made up anatomy? Like, are they things that you're abstracting or are they real? I would say, hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm coming from an, an original reference, but I would only choose a certain part of that and I would draw it as it is, but it's standing on its own, um, almost makes it represented as an abstract image because abstracting is essentially taking something from reality and, you know, warping it a little bit, you know, so um, usually it's that sometimes I'll mix things together, you know, I want to take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and put that together. But I would say that it's still I, I feel like my art still falls in that realm of realism. But always up to interpretation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Our third volunteer. <laughs> I think it was me. So okay, great. Um, sorry for my English. First, it's not my my mother tongue, so I'll try to to be synthesized and very clear. But uh, I'm sorry if I don't know the materials also in, in English but I'll try my best. So let me share my screen. Um, I created a document. Uh, sorry, uh, I have to allow access. One second. I worked on, on, on techno with technology for many years and I still struggle with that. So, uh, Oh no, I'll have to wait, Jennifer, maybe I'll get your help instead of, because okay. I only need to leave in order to open here. So uh, I'll share with you my document. Um, one sec. Okay. Uh, here. Um, okay. Did you get it? Yes. Um, so if you could please share the screen. Um, it, I Meanwhile, I can just uh, talk a little bit about myself. So I'm actually a designer. Um, I worked for many years as a designer, both in print design and also uh, in, in digital design. I spent uh, the last um, seven years working with technology, six of them at Google. Uh, and having said that, drawing has always been uh, something that was present in my life uh, as actually a way for me to disconnect. And Yen and Hannah also talked about meditation. 
for me, drawing has always been a way of uh, really connecting to myself and um, and disconnecting from from the world. So, since last year, I actually decided to quit my previous jobs and dedicate myself 100% to to drawing. So, I'm currently taking a PhD at the Fine Arts uh, School in the University of Lisbon. So. Um, I'm very happy and grateful to have the opportunity of, uh, of sharing what I've been working on. Um, it still is uh, my work. Uh, I'm still in the early phases of development of, uh, of it, and it's really um, aligned with the research that I do uh, for, the th for the thesis. So I base myself a lot in, in readings and uh, in philosophy, for example, and non-dualism. And feminist aesthetics to develop my work. And my, uh, my goal with the PhD is to analyze how observational drawing um, can, can work kind of as a meditation um, in the sense that it can bring you uh, the total attention to, to your surroundings uh, or the object or the model that you are, that you are drawing. And in that, in that way, also uh, tr trying to disconnect a little bit of, the, of all the information that we have, all the accelerated world that we live in. Um, for me personally, I feel that. So now I'm trying to investigate how this can really be something that uh, is academically proven in that sense. So that's what I've been working on. Um, and can you, can you share? I am I am trying and it is not letting me. I, so maybe every... I'll, I'll leave here just to close Zoom and I'll be back in two seconds. Okay. Okay. I need to close the, the application. One second. Yes. Sorry about that. Everything it was not. Sorry working. myself. I should have yeah. tested before. So. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, again, we're going to be flexible today. <laughs> so we'll just pause for a moment and wait for you to return. And in the meantime, I can just reiterate, anyone has any questions or comments, please feel free to share and I'll, I'll make sure that uh, they're forwarded on to the participants. Okay, let's try again. Uh, okay, now I think I got it. Can you see? Awesome, thank you. Okay. Yes. So. I just shared my my contacts here just in case. Uh, ah, I cannot present full screen. Yeah, now okay. So I have a blog where I've been documenting uh, the process of each draw that I drawing that I do, and actually um, this is part of my thesis. So it's in Portuguese, but you can check it out later, because since I talk about uh, observational drawing, I've been trying to apply kind of a method to to of uh, one hundred percent attention to to any model that I drew so and that I draw so actually i don 't have a specific uh, theme that I explore like Hannah or Yen. I tend to be open to all the types of observational drawing, but the method is always the same where I try to to put myself one hundred percent in, a, in a atten attentive to the to the process as I was seeing the object for the first time. As Matisse, I think Matisse said that, said that uh, for the roses, that you should see the roses uh, as you were seeing them for the first time always. So I try to have this kind of method. So that allows me to be able to draw anything that I want to do. So sometimes I focus on lines and uh, interior lines, silhouettes. I'm gonna share just for you to see some examples. Um, or sometimes I focus on uh, just the, the, the interior, um, the, sh the lights and shadows. So I play with that, but always with this mindset of trying to synchronize the eye with the, with the hand. So a little bit as in yoga, where you synchronize your breath with the movement. And I practice yoga as well, and I, I feel a lot of relationship with that. Uh, drawing for me is also a way for, for me to synchronize breath, uh, the eye and the hand, and 
by the end of it, trying or, or during the process, trying to connect with my inner self. And, and so I try to use the simplest materials that I can. So normally I work with pencil, uh, pen or charcoal or uh, pastel. Not, I, I mean, I'd experiment with other materials too, but I tend to, to be very uh, simple and try to get materials that are animal free, uh, cruelty free, <laughs> and that's important for me currently. So, um, so yeah, um, and then I play, I, I read a lot about uh, activities that I can, I can do, exercises that I can do, and I just play with that and, and try to uh, deepen myself into the process and document afterwards in the, in the blog or, and then for the thesis how I feel during and after and kind of like letting myself go throughout this observation of the object. And this can be an, uh, the model. I mean, could be a person, can be an animal or a space. And currently with the COVID situation, I've been drawing a lot in my bedroom. So uh, mm. it actually has become like my, my kind of, I venerate and <laughs> all the space that I have and know all the corners. And I've been also doing some self-portraits for during the COVID because I don't have any models. Well, actually, I, I do have some models who are my friends and family who said that they could pose for me. So I drew some of them. Uh, if you guys want to pose for me one day, I'm open to it. I'm trying to use digital in, the, in our favor in the sense. So here are some drawings that I've been doing with very basic materials and kind of a meditative process. These are, have been done last week. And here also my, my bedroom. Um, and um, also, also um, to show the mix of line and, uh, and shade. I don't know how to say in English shade. Mancha, we say in Portuguese. Um, anyway. uh, and here are some samples of very quick sketches that I've been doing <laughs> for the COVID with my model drawing sessions with my father and my friends. So still doing with others. Um, well, yeah, I think that's, that's it. Um, okay. For me, okay. drawing is, is this um, way of getting uh, into the present moment, really. Um, Nice. Um, there was one question that came through, and that's if you see any relationship with your work and the Surrealists and maybe their um, automatic drawings. Um, yes, the automatic drawings is something that I've been studying a lot. Surrealism, I don't know uh, uh, yet, but definitely when I feel that when I, I am surrendering myself into the process of observing uh, anything actually and without this mental image of uh, ah, this is an apple so I'm, I have this mental image of an apple but then when I just focus on the shapes that I see and kind of like following the lines of it in a very pure way yeah sometimes the result can look like it's surrealistic or automatic because it's really like this kind of synchronization of the eye and the hand and in this sense I think it relates to yoga because in yoga and in meditation, I think it's a practice that you need to keep developing and this kind of synchronization, I think it only will be more natural and kind of automatic once you have this daily practice. So that's the way that I see. I don't know mm -hmm. if you guys agree. I think we should like talk mm -hmm. about it, but, uh, but yeah, that's, what, that's why I like observational drawing in the sense of, uh, of course, you can observe your mind, maybe, and this can be also an experiment. Maybe Yen is doing that in her drawings. Uh, <laughs> but for me, it's really helpful to to draw from observation because it's also a way, in my thesis, I talk about how it's a way of also creating empathy with the surroundings mm -hmm. and seeing things mm -hmm. in a more pure way. So uh, that's, uh, that's it. <laughs> and I hope by the end of the four years, I'll have something more like... <laughs> more uh, defined way of drawing maybe or maybe not I don't know but it's now it's just experimenting <laughs> trying to experiment as much as possible I think those are great experiments and I like the way you put it in that combination of seeing observation drawing as being like yoga because when I think of yoga as being like that 
yoke between the mind and the body. I think observational drawing, when we are just purely looking, mm -hmm. um, and Hannah, I would be curious if you have any thoughts on, on this as well. When we're just purely looking and we're trying to get that connection between hand and eye and coordination, which is really hard, um, it also quietens the, the mind. It is so meditative. Yeah. Um, Sometimes I feel when I really, I'm open to living, uh, to, I normally I define like a material and um, a focus point on what I'm gonna draw. Sometimes it can be a detail, sometimes the, the silhouette. I don't know, uh, I define it previously so I don't have to think about it while I'm doing that. But also it helps me because by the end of the process, sometimes I, I let my, my, my observation to the to the object flow in a way that I sometimes see the drawing in the end and I think oh it doesn't look like I did it it like it kind of takes me to somewhere else and I don't know how it happened mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah I, I was gonna say about the meditation something that I've been reading about and trying to have make relations is the mantra meditation uh, so uh, transcendental meditation, mantra meditation, mm -hmm. they, when you focus your, uh, your attention to a mantra, uh, could be a sound or, a, or an object, and you focus your attention and your breath to that. I'm trying to relate that to observational drawing too, in a way that the model that you draw, no matter if it's a person or space or uh, anything, this focus could be like a mantra in the way that you... You really focus your attention to that, so you 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 silence your mind in a way. So that's one of the hypotheses that I'm studying in the thesis as well. So basically that. <laughs> great, great. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Ole, would you like to go ahead? Yeah. Sure. Uh, but I to share screen? Yes, if, if you can. If I can, okay. Uh, I thought I saw desktop. Desktop one, is that the one? Um, click uh, that and we'll see. <laughs> okay. Nothing happens. Whiteboard. No, the, yeah, the whiteboard, unless you want to actually live draw for us. No, Firefox <laughs> lock on Dropbox. I can try that. We should whiteboard draw next time. That would oh, yes. That would be fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll try that. Okay. Uh, It's not working, uh, but it's not working. Okay, I think if one of us, if you want to come out of screen share, I'll get someone to share your website with us. Would that work? Okay. That, that, that work. That's fine. Uh, I don't know, go back here. Um, if you go back up and the share content and just hit stop sharing. I need to go out and then, oh, okay, I need to go. Oops, did we lose him all together? I think it's the only way he can unscreen share. Okay, which is strange. Um, so we'll give him a second um, to return. Again, we're staying flexible today with technology, although I do like the idea of um, 
doing a whiteboard live drawing session, <laughs> um, next time. So I'm having a little trouble sharing from a URL as well. So I put um, um, Ole's uh, website in the chat. So when he returns, if one of the panelists could share um, their screen with that URL, that would be great. I don't think that's his URL, Jennifer. Um, when the one that you just posted, I, I, here, oh. I have, I can do it. Okay. okay. It, yeah. Cause then it, I, he is on that website though. Oh, I didn't. So do you have to look for his work there? I just went on Google images and saw a few things. If you just type his name in an artist. There we go. Beautiful. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll give him just a, a few more seconds. And if okay, I tell you what, um, Nicole, would you be okay to go ahead and get started, and then hopefully um, um, Ole will join us soon, and then we could do the screen sharing then. Yeah, absolutely. I'm. Uh, I'm just Okay, I'm just gonna going to grab my uh, images and And while you're pulling those up, a few questions have come up about our responses to uh, COVID-19. And I'll hold those till the end and we can all chime in. Okay, okay first of all, uh, is this sideways? No. No. No, it's fine? Yes. Here, I'm just going to... Okay, I just want to thank, uh, and I'm just, uh, I just want to thank uh, Jennifer and everyone for, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank everyone for uh, this opportunity. It's, uh, it's nice to be able to talk about new work and be able to present uh, at this time when we're all so much in isolation. So the first image here is an image that I, uh, is an installation that I did uh, at the Bounce Center for the Arts. And usually with drawing, it, I, drawing is like the start, sort of the second start and the end point of, of uh, my process in working. So in order to uh, start making the work, because I was working on a, a performance in sculpture, um, a performative, I was trying to combine performance and sculpture together and, and I was having a hard time. So the, the start of it was I drew, I, I thought I had to draw a line and draw a line in metaphorically being like I've had to stop with the uh, stop with trying to think of how am I going to make sculpture? How am I going to make performance? So then I physically um, drew a huge line across my whole m the whole studio and that was the start of me making um, the work and the work is in sculpture and drawing and uh, it used performance as uh, performative activities as, as its start. Um, 
And here I'm just going to, my images might not be in the right order here, but uh, so I ended up uh, making an S-shaped curve uh, performance pr prop and uh, taking photos of myself interacting, interacting with that, that performance prop. So I'll just go through some of the pieces of the installation. And then I, uh, from those photos, I uh, ended up uh, drawing those photos onto the, the walls of the studio. So here's another um, image of, um, of me interacting with the performance prop. And then also I made sculptures that accompanied with that. And then the sculptures I was also uh, interacting with and then drawing as well and so this is these are the sculpt the um, handles are uh lathed wood lathed um uh objects that I ended up casting in bronze and the whole uh part of the work was about um what happens in the past and what happens in the present and does anything stay does have something go towards the present and because all of these drawings end up um, being painted over so this is the, the the initial performance prop that that became and I, I see it as like um, a drawing in itself and then there's also uh, whole portions of, uh, of it that, that, so it's more s a sculptural uh, pieces. And then this is some more of the, the performance prop. Okay, so then that's the, that was the first body. So then I, again, I'm starting to work with the idea of um, uh, performance and sculpture and how does that work? So the, the whole, um, basis of the the project always I, I'm always trying to weigh out what's performance what's sculpture and how do they intertwine and what am I saying between the two and that's when I start drawing so these objects came out of uh, drawings and it came out of uh, the actually the drawings came uh, the sculptures came out of uh, the leaking rad in my studio and then I had uh, sessions where people could perform and um, experiment with the, the, the sculptures. And then from there, I ended up uh, taking uh, photos and then juxtaposing the photos on uh, and installing them on butcher paper. And I used a projector for this one, this one because um, uh, and because these were really fast, uh, fast installation. And then these are, uh, so I had uh, open uh, nights where people could come in and just interact with the, the sculptures. And then uh, this is now the, the current work that I was um, starting to work on towards uh, what I was going to do at L'Arts is again working with the idea of sculpture, performance, and um, design. And so I was uh, using collage and then drawing from the collages, uh, basic design shapes, and seeing how um, the dot, square, line, circle, triangle uh, impacts uh, physical, physical bodies and design. So, oh, sorry, that was from the last, the last body of work. And uh, so again, so, so I'm, I'm experimenting with um, images of myself and then I'm also juxtaposing right now, I'm working on this idea of um, snakes and uh, the idea, like a dualistic um, expression of good and evil and, and um, ideas about re rebirth and renewal. So again, I'm just experimenting with my, um, with my images of myself and then uh, drawing those images uh, with, uh, and so I'm, I'm juxtaposing two, uh, two, two unlike things together just to create a new, a, a, a new meaning. So, so this is, uh, this is what I've been doing since, um, uh, since COVID and since being at, in my studio. And then also, uh, 
I have images of, uh, I'm, I ended up, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I am, am, I also am doing lots of textiles right now. And I think that this is the last image. And I just, I want to show the two pigeons that are close outside of my studio window. So I think, oh, I think that, that this one's it. Okay, that's pretty much me. Okay. Um, Nicole, there was um, one question that came in um, with one of the projects. You said it began with a leak or a leaking part of your studio. Could you explain mm -hmm. that a little bit? Yeah, because I, I have a radiator that that's, uh, is constantly leaking. And uh, so like little things like that will start becoming ideas to make bigger work. So the, the leaking trail in my studio ended up, um, I drew a big pond and then I thought, well, this would be a great thing to be able to interact with. And, and then I started building sculptures based around that. So it's, there's always a little bit of an, like a tiny little idea that I'll grow into something and, and then use the combination between drawing uh, sculpture and usually drawings the start and the end and then textiles and um, sculpture and performance. Mm -hmm. Is it just natural that it happened that way that drawing was sort of like the bookmarks the beginning and end? Yeah because um, I like with drawing how it's a document of what is there and so drawing is great to work on ideas but what I also find so amazing about drawing is if you draw something you see more what is actually there than if you're just observing okay yeah. well I like that um with your performances and so often in performance art it's the documentation that people usually interact with you know a lot of famous performances we see via video or photography and it's mm -hmm. it's like documentation and drawing is so much about documentation too so it's really interesting mm -hmm. i don't you, as, as a drawer i don't identify as a performer they seem like very different things but you've done a really nice job of bringing them together it's in, it's interesting thank you mm -hmm. Um, another question, Nicole, um, would you say that you're influenced by dance? One of our um, watchers, Rachel, has noticed that your figures look very dancer-like. Mm. Um, actually, in the past few years, I've been learn, um, spending time or concentrated time learning uh, dance, just not as like a, a dancer, but just knowing as how to how to move. Uh, I, I'm really interested right now in the, like, ge the geometric um, patterns that basic ballet uh, exercises have. So, that's great. great. Thank you. Any other questions for Nicole? Okay. Um, well, I think we would get back. Um, I'll keep my fingers crossed that maybe at some point um, he will return. Um, I wanted to share a few images of my work and then um, we'll chat a little bit about um, how the situation has affected our creativity and our process and things of that nature. Um, there was one more question, um, Nicole, if you make, oh. I think I just missed what you said. J Jennifer, do you hear me? Question. Um, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, very briefly, but now I can hear you. Okay, the question was just since you work in fiber, do you also make face masks? And I think that might be in relation to COVID-19, but maybe mm. also about your uh, performances. 
No, I haven't uh, been doing anything with, um, I haven't made any face masks. I, and the first thing that I did with COVID-19 was so um, I'm making a tank top out of recycled material. So uh, I'm just drawing, I mean, uh, sewing bits and pieces of fabric together to make uh, a shirt. But no, I haven't done any kind of face masks. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. All right. So to share a little bit about um, my work, and it may um, at first seem strange that um, I'm talking about on a panel about drawing and was going to a drawing residency when you first view my work because I am more of a, I would consider myself more of a mixed media artist and I have um, for quite some now, time now um, combined photography with the hand drawn. Um, and the goal of this work though is always to combine the two media in a unified poetic statement. Um, and I, if I were to label as myself as anything other than an artist, um, I would say that I am a drawer and would never say that I'm a photographer. And that's in part because the photograph never stands on its own. I'm always drawing or printing or cutting into it, doing something um, to it. Um, I combine drawing and photography intentionally to play with the specific meanings and time structures innate in both media. To me, the photograph is a mechanical um, and capturing of one moment, one instant, while drawing is the longer recorded of my repeated visceral moment. Um, and there's something to me that in my work that comes through when there is one moment merged with thousands of moments in a compression of time um, that deals with the, the interplay of space time and the merging of all the event, events past, present, and future. Um, I tend to gravitate, gravitate towards drawing in a very laborious process. Um, for example, this piece here, which are Two panels, um, each are 17 inches tall by about 28 inches wide. Um, it's made by using a very small, here's a detail, very fine mechanical pencil and a ruler, and just repeating the mark again and again and again. So literally I see this as a accumulation, a tracing of time live on the paper. And in some ways is very similar to um, Yen's um, COVID-19 drawings um, and some of the other attributes that the other panelists have been talking to um, about time and meditation. It's also very much part of my work. In the last few years, um, I've also been um, thinking about time through the use of the paper in which I use. So I've completed um, several series of drawings now on paper that I've taken from antique ledger books. And I also have to say, I typically joke with my students that I'm snobbish about two things. One is beer. I don't drink Corona, only craft beer for me. And the other is paper, because I think the paper in which an artist chooses to work on um, can greatly affect their end product, both physically and conceptually. So since a lot of this work has to do with time, um, working with the pages that have been carefully taken out of the ledger book sort of foregrounds that as these books were created um, to deal with the organization and transfer of goods and or money. Um, it also has this interesting predicament that I take a book, sometimes these books are 100 years old, and I actually cut it apart. And so I take that sequential quality of a book where pages are usually one, two, three, and I break it apart. And in my own little way, um, I think of this as reflecting a little bit of chaos theory um, into the work. And as you can see, I'm very influenced by contemporary physics. Um, I had a chance for three years to team teach with a physicist, a course that was art and physics. Um, and so a lot of my work deals with the concepts of space time or has been influenced by readings that I've read, such as the reality that um, the universe is expanding at such a greater and, and more rapid rate that ultimately, if Earth and humans are still here, the night sky will be um, completely um, devoid of stars. 
Um, the ledger paper is also a really beautiful surface. It's drawing to me, it's very tactile. Um, and I'm always very aware of how the pencil moves across the paper. Um, and so it's a beautiful surface to draw on, but it's a bit unpredictable to print on with inkjet printing. So you can see um, in the piece here on the lower left, how the inkjet has actually kind of puddled up on top of this paper because it's buffered. And so it has a surface that's more like the craculature of an antique painting. Um, when I created these works, um, I also was thinking a lot about the formalities of space um, and how I could um, create as much physical space as possible within the work, that illusion of three-dimensionality, um, at times with the least number of parts or pieces. Um, so I think you can maybe see that here as well as some other plays um, into three-dimensional space. Um, I also continuously work with graphite. And when I'm saying I work with graphite, um, I'm typically working with mechanical pencils that I can pick up at Target um, or CVS. Um, when I first started working with mechanical pencils, um, it was because of a residency in, on the island of Malta. And I wasn't sure what was going to be available with me on the island to work with, so what could I pack into one suitcase? So the mechanical pencils meant two pencils and a ton of lead in a Ziploc bag, and I was set for the 35 days I was going to be there. Um, it was perfect. Um, but I like that graphite, especially in that form, is pretty ubiquitous, um, and you can pick it up anywhere. And so I like that kind of transformation of a material that um, we're all familiar with that's so common at moments. Um, I also find it really intriguing um, that graphite um, is pure carbon. And in fact, what's an interesting kind of nerdy trivial pursuit moment, it, so are diamonds. It's just that slight difference in the crystal structure that produces two different things. But all life on human, all life on earth, human life included, is carbon-based. So I find it um, an evocative material to work with to show our similarities and the interconnectedness between everything on earth at the mo molecular level um, and beyond. Um, Elegance and a refined simplicity are also very important to my work and something that I keep striving for. And sometimes I refer to the work just as concrete poems. Um, and in terms of influences, I think of Agnes Martin, the lyrical landscapes of Yves Tanguy, um, and the merging of art and meditative experience in the work of Marth Rothko, as well as the work of Helma A.F. Klimt and Emma Kuntz, um, both who were women who were early pioneers in abstraction, but they blended um, art making with their own um, mystical practices. Okay, and I think there might have been since that came as I was talking, and I'll I can't read and do that at the same time, so I'll go back and answer those. And I'm really glad to see that Ole um, is back. So one question um, was if, if quantum ph physics has um, been inspirational to me, and absolutely, and, and literally within the work, I think about the space-time continuum <laughs> and how the photograph is like one second, the drawing is like thousands of seconds and how it gets flattened in the same way that in space-time, the past, present, and future all collapse into one. Um, and let's see, there might have been um, another question. Uh, there was a question from Benjamin if the, uh, the clouds were drawn or printed. Um, the clouds are photographs that I have taken um, of the sky, and that really started when I um, moved from Los Angeles, where Hannah is at now, um, to Virginia. And there's, there was a huge atmospheric difference between that flat area 
of Los Angeles up against the Pacific and living in this um, bowl of a valley in the Blue Ridge Mountains in Southwest Virginia. And it started with me just using my iPhone, taking tons of photos. Um, and then like most artists, as you start to collect things, then eventually they become sort of like fodder <laughs> for something that you make um, creatively. So ultimately at some point I just started made up with this decision like well what can I do with these photos and that kind of started me on this path that I've been on for a while and I think someone also asked for me to type in my um, inspirations and I will do that as our next speaker um, Ole is speaking um, I think Ole we can um, share uh, can um, I or, just ask something uh, yeah, well, of not, course. Not yeah asking, sorry not, not asking but just a comment I, sure. There is a, a, a quote from Cartier-Bresson, the photographer, that I like a lot. And I think it really relates to your work perfectly. Because uh, by the end of his career, I don't know if you guys knew, but he, he started to draw again. He used to draw and then he started to photograph. And then he, when he was 80 years old, he started to draw again. And then he said, uh, before he died, he said that for him, photograph is an instant reaction and drawing is a meditation. And I think for you, your work is perfect because you mix both the instant and the meditative process of, of drawing. Mm -hmm. so, so interesting. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, Hannah, can you share the Google search that you did again? So then we'll have some of Ole's images on the screen. Okay, sure. Let me... Okay, so I'll mute myself and I'll let him speak. Okay. Cool. <laughs> well, uh, some, uh, about 2010, I was starting a big project with a, a good friend of mine, a writer. Uh, we had an idea about, I had an idea actually about, you know, drawing um, the old oaks in Denmark, uh, as you can see. Uh, uh, this is, uh, oh, yeah, can I, yeah, they're, they're, pre they're pretty big, about uh, one meter and 40 by uh, one meter, uh, and, and all pencil drawings, and uh, it took me five years to, to do that project. Um, I was traveling all over Denmark. Uh, with my friend, the writer, and we did this uh, book called uh, Oak Exhibitions. And it was um, shown in different museums uh, in Denmark. Uh, I think I, I made 82 drawings uh, in, uh, in those five years. Uh, and about 54 of them was exhibited. And later on, yeah, you can see the screen, you can see them here. Uh, uh, it was a major success. Uh, and uh, actually it was kind of meditative because um, when I started the project in 2010, uh, it was just of curiosity, you know, how to draw an oak in that size uh, and with using just a pencil. Uh, and then uh, unfortunately, uh, soon after I got uh, diagnosed with uh, cancer in my bladder uh, and uh, I didn't know whether I should live or die. Uh, but um, I had a surgery and uh, heavy uh, medication and whatever, but every morning I went down to my studio and my easel and sat drawing and, and that helped uh, actually and uh, I of course I still am here and uh, uh, there, there was a fantastic thing to draw these old trees and uh, I did a lot of research on the trees and I talked to a lot of uh, people who knew something about trees, you know, scientists and uh, biologists and everything. Uh, and uh, 
it helped me through that uh, period of heavy medication. Uh, as I said before, the, the, the project was a big success and, uh, and uh, uh, we made a big book uh, on it and it was uh, printed in uh, famous thousand, I think, uh, samples sold out. Uh, and we were very happy. And later on, yeah, that is. And later on, we uh, we were asked to do something else uh, called uh, the cultural uh, uh, something something about taking taking up some some uh, some old forgotten places on the island of Fuji where I live. Uh, and. Uh, that's what it did, and right now we are working with a project called uh, Spectre about uh, where we're taking. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a lot of portraits. They're not in. They are not on this side, but uh, I, maybe I can find them. Uh, and we were just in the process of doing that when this. Uh, yeah, that's 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 the size where on this. Uh, uh, Muslim thing. Uh, there was a very big. Uh, there was a lot of publicity on it. Uh, uh, it's, it's pencil drawing and, and uh, put a little color on it. Later on, I've been working with the charcoal and uh, the latest one, and then uh, this uh, uh, Corona thing stopped me and I returned to the uh, to the Oaks to get some peace in mind and uh, for the past three weeks I'm sitting here at home and uh, made, made a, a uh, take my my easel back and uh, put, a, put some big uh, uh, papers up and, and started to draw, draw some Oaks again and uh, uh, it's like coming back make, it makes me peace because I'm very worried about this situation. I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's scary. But, but sitting there and uh, drawing oaks again with a pencil it takes about two weeks to do one drawing. Uh, uh, it's two, three weeks and then that's, that's peaceful, meditative. And, uh, and I hope this uh, COVID will uh, end and we we'll get a, a better world out of it. And, uh, but so far, I'm just uh, trying to do my best. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ole, may I ask um, just one question? And there might be some more. Um, but um, are there, these trees are, 200 to 300 years old, is that correct? Yeah, they're more. The oldest oh, wow. one, the oldest one is there. Uh, it's, it's about 2000 years old. Wow, that's just amazing. Is there any um, cultural um, or symbolic importance to these trees in Denmark? Um, other than the fact that it's just amazing they're still alive and that old. Uh, yeah, they all, they all, uh, they all have, they, 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 they have stories from, they all have stories that are connected to, uh, to where they are. And, and since they're that old, that, and they're, they're, they're methodical and, uh, they have, some of them, you know, have, uh, uh healing, uh, things mm. that, uh, it's not just a tree, and and I was not just drawing trees. I was uh, doing portraits of trees. They're all individuals, and the oak mm -hmm. is a special thing. Uh, as of course, I was inspired by Tolkien, and uh, the passages in Tolkien, uh, or the figures in Tolkien, has, has always been the uh, the old trees. And uh, as uh, uh, where the oaks are the wisest one, 
the oak tree is a bias tree. Mm. So uh, I'm still fascinated by the oaks. And I, I can't go, I have some oaks in my backyard, by the way. I go up and give them a hug once in a while. Mm. You can't hug each other now, but you can hug each wow. other. <laughs> 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 oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Ole? I was going to say, I think it's interesting, Ole, that you're in this time, and this probably relates to some of the other questions about how COVID is affecting us, that you said you returned to the oak trees because they were, that's what, where you needed peace from. And I feel sort of the same way that I'm returning to these drawings that I had started with many years ago. And it was something that I needed to do just to kind of calm myself down. And I really, I think that is something that is really essential right now. Yeah, that's what I, uh, uh, I sworn by oath that I would never ever draw a tree again after <laughs> five years, <laughs> you know, from morning to night. But, uh, but actually, I found really totally peace. I'm sitting there, and I'm going in. When I go in next door, where I have uh, my uh, little studio uh, for now, uh, and it's wonderful. And I have uh, I listen to books, and then I sit there for hours, for hours. Mm -hmm. uh, wow! With my my little with my pencils. You know, I have different. I have. A, a, a lot of pencils, you know, from 2B to up to 8B and 9B. Uh, <laughs> it, it is it's actually like, okay, I think I'm gonna, we're going to survive. <laughs> um, so Ole, I, I have another question from Benjamin. Uh, he wanted to know if the finished oak drawings are from real life sketches or photos. No, they're taken from photos. I, 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 it takes two, three, uh, three weeks to do one. Uh, and I, I take a lot of photos. And, uh, but, but, uh, and I use them, the photo as my sketch. But, but uh, the more, uh, the further I go into my drawing, I see things in that from that photo that I have not realized in, that they were there. And suddenly there's a troll, suddenly there's a uh, head, there's a hand, there's something. There's always some weird figures coming into my oak. And I, especially today, after I have drawn oak trees for five years and taken them up again, I, I can really feel that I am uh, putting or finding something in, in these trees that uh, they are there and they're just there for me to take and that's, that's wonderful. So I create stories when I, uh, because the process is so slow, so I create a story, a lot of stories. The last last one I did was from, uh, I called Pierre Gint's book from uh, Ibsen's uh, story because I suddenly heard uh, Greeks uh, uh, music of Pierre Gunt, and uh, so that's so that turned out to be that. Great. Ah, uh, okay. So that was great. Thank you so much, Ole. So we've received a couple of questions um, from the. Um, watchers, yours, um, that I want to ask all of you um, so you can chime in. Um, but most of them are about the current situation. Um, so um, one question is, um, do, you, do any of the artists have any tips for artist block, especially now in this time of isolation? I think For me, a person. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> I, I I think a person just has to go with it. If there's a little idea, just to start with doing something, um, because there's a so much artist like and now 
without having a library or without having uh, um, lots of inspiration or without having lots of different like artist dates that people can go on, um, it's uh, it, it, artist block is real. So I think if you can just find one thing that's interesting or a reflection or a, some a something small and um, just start building upon that, that might. Ahead, yeah, I feel Hannah. like um, artist block usually comes as a result of your mind saying that you can't do something. Um, so, you know, sitting and pondering upon it more doesn't usually solve it for me. So, you know, just working on something, even if it's just pulling out something I started a while ago and just getting the pen or paper moving, you know, um, and then hopefully as a result, I can start to move away from that and move more into my hands and my experience and not so much be in my head, you know? And it doesn't have to be something amazing. Maybe that piece was leading up to that next thing that you're about to make. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think also you can just start with something that comforts you right now. Right. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's when I was thinking of Ole going back to the oak trees and mm -hmm. when this all started and we were trapped in our homes. I mean, for us, I don't have access to a studio anymore. And so I just started drawing like little circles and I just kept going. And for days, I would just sit there and I would draw little circles over and over. And then eventually it started becoming, there started a narrative started emerging out of it, an idea, a story. But in the beginning, I was just doing something that made me feel better. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes you don't have to worry about where it's going or what it's going to be or what the story is. You can just, you know, sit there and make endless strokes and maybe it will make you feel better. Yeah. Yeah. I know I'm not putting any pressure to make like my best piece ever right now. Like, <laughs> You're a masterpiece. Exactly. I'm doing yeah. a landscape oil painting yeah. right now just because it seemed really fun. And I was yeah. like, I don't really feel mm -hmm. like drawing anything serious right now. I just yeah. want to have something fun that I do, you know, like just paint and be free. You know? yeah. 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 I also, I think that uh, the opportunity of us having this exchange right now is also a way of kind of allowing us to, to, to do what we feel like doing. But in my case specifically, I have still some online classes that have been really helpful in order to exchange with my colleagues. And I also have a WhatsApp group with other friends who are not like mm -hmm. artists. They are just friends who like arts and we've been doing some sharing what, we, what we've been doing. And sometimes we kind of define like, ah, okay, so here's a, like a painting and let's do something with that painting. Could be a drawing, could be like a sculpture. Mm -hmm. And sometimes art, uh, we draw, but it uh, doesn't need necessarily to be a drawing that is the end result. The important thing I think is to try mm -hmm. to like express yourself uh, in the way that is, that is possible right now, right? Mm -hmm. But exchanging mm -hmm. with other people, for me personally is important, uh, having feedbacks and sharing mm -hmm. yeah I, I say like doing those oak drawings now they are not for uh they're not for a big museum exhibition or anything like the other ones you know i had a deadline and uh, uh to make and uh and everything and it was a book a big book and a publisher and everything so uh it was, it was a lot of pressure and it was a lot of money in it. Uh, but now I'm just doing it for myself. And uh, I'm putting them out on, on, on the net and say, okay, here's <laughs> oak number one, two, three, on, in the time of the corona. And uh, I just stack them in there. And I, I don't know if they're ever going to be exhibited, or, but I don't care. Actually, I had my my peace with them it makes and, and if I can give uh, people some peace about uh, you know watching them on the net mm -hmm. that's, that's fine with me. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know um, thinking of all of these comments it makes me think of um, the Artist Way program and, and that one of the things um, that's mentioned in that program is that the pressure to make great art is sometimes the biggest saboteur of making any art. So mm -hmm. what I'm hearing um, from all of you is that now is the time to just make what feels good, mm -hmm. to jump yeah. in, 
be playful or meditative or crazy or quiet, whatever, um, revisit something old, try something new, um, but just do what feels right in this moment and what makes you feel good. Um, we don't know what's, what's going to happen on the other side. Right? <laughs> Very true. So the next question might be directed a little bit more towards Yen, because the question is, have any of the artists been inspired to make artwork about COVID-19? So I'll let you start with that one, Yen, and then wait, if I'm anyone gonna, else I'm wants. Gonna, I'm going to show you. Wait, let me show you on my screen. That would be funny. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, I, uh, it's, I wasn't, I mean, when we were talking about this and how you can overcome block or what it's like to make art now, I, you know, originally I, I didn't know at all what I was doing. And then as the days have passed, I've started feeling more able to react to where our situation is. And I had just accepted a, I, a residency with, with a studio space that I'd never had before at Trestle. And so I was getting, I brought all my stuff over. I was super excited. I was going to work on these ginormous landscapes. And, and then, and then, and then here I am on my dining room table that I'm sharing with, you know, my entire family. But so, yeah, I, I have been making now some more COVID artwork and I'll show you this one quickly because it's also just funny. Um, I, I'm working with this friend and I'm producing uh, coloring mandalas and this one has uh, toilet paper and face masks mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's what was on my mind. <laughs> so yeah, so it's all over the place. <laughs> sometimes funny, sometimes abstract, sometimes yeah, a lot of different things. That's great. Thank you. Has anyone else been inspired to make any artwork that deals directly with COVID-19? Personally, I've been wanting to do the opposite. I just want to kind of get away. This is my escape, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't want to have to. Uh, you know, my work deals with the body and it seems like it would be a great tie-in. It almost feels cliche. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm focusing again, just not on Like I'm just using this time to make um and and do things that doing the art projects i always say i wish i had time for because this is now the time that i have for that so yeah i'm using this time to to hide out kind of and just do stuff that is like the sewing projects and the um painting like enamel on a uh, ceramics piece that i was working like you know things that i'm that that they can't can make you kind of hide away a little bit anyone else i feel the same i think it's a time for me um and i i realized i realized early on in this to preserve my mental health i had to separate a little bit limit my news um and so that makes me at this moment not want to really do anything that directly relates to COVID-19 um I also sometimes feel that the best work about a situation like this can happen afterwards once you have some time to mm -hmm. reflect and because we you know we're still kind of this is and I know there's and yeah and I think yours was fun and perfect and it you know in many many ways but um you know i feel like as we're in the moment sometimes it's a little hard unless it is a fun kind of thing like that to make art about mm -hmm. something so so dire if you will um so another question that came through is sort of similar is like how has the pandemic affected how you see art in general um or your own art and art making practice or maybe I'll add a little bit to it. Does it leave you with any concerns about art and the art world? Yeah, I can. I think I, I would have a comment on that. Uh, I've always been um, <clears throat> uh, the year of 1913, uh, before the First World War. Uh, this. Uh, uh, time that we are living in now kind of uh, reminds me about that. I've always, I was always been uh, inspired about that because everything, uh, I have this saying that uh, everything happened before 1913 
uh, and now that Jack shit happened after that, it's always repeating. Art has always repeating itself since that. Uh, it's 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 true, of course, in in, in a certain ex extent, but uh, nothing new had happened. And uh, so, what's going to happen now? Uh, uh, we have had uh, we've had Netflix and and, and uh, all these things about catastrophe uh, series and everything. Uh, they're kind of outdated, aren't they? Uh, so now we have, we see the real thing and it's really, it's really, really scary. We see uh, America, United States with a, a president who can handle the situation and uh, what's going to happen to the United States is that uh, the fall of the United States like the fall of Rome like some people predict, uh, but of course, art and artists are always going to. That's going to be, uh, and culture is going to be the way that uh, the, the human race can survive. And that's, I think, that's our. Uh, that's what we are going in. Uh, that's very, very important. Uh, so it's not collapsing in. Uh, riots and war and whatever, and that we have our uh, human thinkings and that we can create, uh, still create art and still uh, and think and create art without thinking about that it is a thing that we have to sell and that art is it's not a, uh, uh, what do you say, it, it's art is beyond the money so to speak, mm. and I think it's very important. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments on that question? Oh, that was my cat. <laughs> <laughs> I find it interesting that so many artists uh, really um, grow and feed their their uh, practices by t going to residencies and and usually because uh, uh, most most artists I know also have like a whole bunch of different kinds of either one or two or three or four different jobs and work contract and freelance and work you know like they have we're, we're spread pretty pretty thin as, as art makers. And so I find that going away uh, and participating in residencies or initiatives are always a way of like making, um, uh, making a solid, solid body of work or solid, like really working out ideas um, pretty uh, like substantially. So this whole change um, in terms of uh, like not traveling, not um, not like having social distance. I'm still questioning what that looks like for my practice and like where the mind shift happen will happen have to happen uh, to yeah just just in the way my process in 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 working usually works really good when I'm have concentrated time to like just make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Were you going to add something in? I was just thinking, and, and the, the tricky thing is, right, we won't know what that will mean to not have those concentrated times in residency or access to studio right now. Or And so in one sense, you could say maybe this is incredible time to discover something mm -hmm. because we won't know what it means yet until until much, much later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the one great thing about this situation is artists and art institutions are proving their creativity. Mm -hmm. You know, there is so much, maybe, yes, you know, just so much information <laughs> and things that are available virtually now. I was going to say almost too much because mm -hmm. there, you know, so many programmings we now have access to. Museums are doing virtual exhibitions. Um, we're talking today. Um, but uh, it's, it isn't the same 
us face to face. Um, so I guess maybe my hope is that when this is done, that face to face experience of seeing a drawing in person um, will be even more important and valuable mm -hmm. now that we've had this time um, away from it all or only seeing it mediated through our screens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, I don't know about the art institutions, but sorry. Um, no. I think artists are so resilient though. I mean, the thing is like, I feel like I could create anywhere with anything if you give me some time <laughs> and some tools, you know, like let's mm -hmm. make it happen, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we all have this attitude if we're doing this together right now and we didn't even get an opportunity to work together in Paris, you know? Yeah. So I think um, while some people it's easy to shudder away and I do feel that sometimes it's like, the resilience of the artist is really, um, and that's something I've always admired when you look at art created like during certain moments in history, you know, mm -hmm. and you're like, God, I can't believe they were making these things under these influences or this like, you know, knowing the backlog of what was going on at the time. And like, we are those people now. So like, what, what are we going to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, King Lear, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'll illustrate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that also, um, you know, leads that point, maybe question, are we a little bit more lucky to be drawers in this time frame, rather than sculptors or ceramicists? I don't know, but it, it could be that we are because um, most of our tools we can travel and work out of home really easily with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think like Hannah says, it's it artists are adaptable, right? So if you're a sculptor and you can't have access to your material, you'll just figure something else out to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think I think what drawing can help is for new people who want to get introduced to to arts in general. Right now, I feel a lot of people are starting to draw or starting to play in an instrument, for example, if they have an instrument, but drawing is really so accessible for not only artists, but for everyone that, that right now, I think is a, not only an, an artistic uh, language, but also a therapeutic one. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments um, that anyone out there wants to share with the panelists or that the panelists have? It definitely makes me more, uh, I'm so glad that you put this together and now I feel even more like <laughs> wanting to see you in real life, <laughs> considering this is the first time that we've met. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and to see your work and to, yeah, and to have conversations that, you know, go on about, about, about all of this. Yeah, I think we'll value, value much more uh, when we meet. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I think so too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really and as, as I said in, in the beginning, and I, I'm not, I'm going to see if I can um, screen share that again, because Did I lose everyone? I think no. my system just completely crashed when I. <laughs> uh, um, so I, um, 
I apologize about that. My system completely crashed. And so, uh, as I was saying, technology, um, good and bad. But what I was trying to do, and maybe I'm going to try it once more and we'll see, was to share <laughs> a couple of screens because as we are getting to this wrap up point, um, so this is the screen. My thanks to the Bakehouse, who really this is possible. Um, Kathy Left sent out an email that mentioned the possibility of virtual programming. And we had been talking, the, the group from Lair had been talking. So these are the other upcoming events that I mentioned um, starting next Thursday with the web series, um, next Tuesday's conversation, and then the, the podcast of meditations. And then I definitely wanted to share this screen. Um, this is the um, social media initiative that um, Mila has been doing, playing off the mm -hmm. idea of Lair being both um, the French word for um, artist in residence and the Lair as the artist studio. So it's highlighting um, residents and um, what they're doing in their um, shelter in place um, studio now. Um, from home. And so you can also see um, the website and the uh, social media for Lair as well. Okay, so in our last couple of minutes, I'm not going to touch any more buttons. <laughs> so hopefully <laughs> I won't lose anyone again. Um, but do you guys have any closing thoughts um, or comments before we all log off? Ah, so I, I did get a note that there are some art students listening in. Um, does anyone want to share some wisdom, encouragement, et cetera? Um, which might be a, a good kind of closing kind of, what is your wisdom or encouragement for art students right now? I think art is essential. I think uh, it's really important work that uh, you're doing if you're an art student or if you're an artist or if you're a creator in any way. I think um, it's it's really important. I think the world needs needs artists. So even though it's it's hard to kind of see in the short term, in the long term, it's it's of utmost most utmost importance that's my thought <laughs> i agree i agree. agree i think also you know something that i have been finding invaluable is having these small communities or contacts with other artists and just you know i know for instance my daughter likes to just pop open a Zoom screen with three of her best friends and they just sit there and they kind of do homework together and they're not even talking to each other. They're not directly engaged, but just having the atmospheric idea that you you have a small community around you, I think is helpful for when you're trying to work through, you know, whatever creativity, creative, creative moment that you might be having. And I think too, just um, for students, you know, I mean, this is the time now more than ever to just create and, you know, really let your impulses go and just go with the flow. And, you know, you're making, like, as we've all said, as professionals, we're currently just making for ourselves. And so you should feel off, like, you know, the freedom to do that too. Not be worried about the class critique or the grade or, you know, whatever it's going to be shown in, you know, it's all just about you and making for your own creative fulfillment. I would say the same as Hannah, but keep working. Yeah. <laughs> I think I would agree with all of that. I think um, one of the things um, hearing on it's really important um, and also um, to reflect other people 
finding your community and looking at as much art as possible. I feel like sometimes as students, your definition of what art is can be really small, which is which is fine. Like we all have to begin somewhere, but looking at as much as you can um, to really expand what you think art is um, will help you ultimately to find what you want to do um, as an artist. All right. Well, we're almost to the end of our time, so I want to thank each of you for joining me today. My technological issues <laughs> and all. Um, I enjoyed hearing all of you speak about your work and I learned so much about who you are and your practices um, and this has just been so um, enlightening for me um, and I want to thank the participants. I think we had um, more than 50 people who joined us at, or that was the high point. There might have been diff a, a larger number that popped in and out so I'm really excited that that many people um, came to hear you speak and see some of your work today. So as we sign off, I say thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, thank you. Be safe and stay well. Okay. Thanks a lot, thank Jennifer. You thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. This is great. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. See you soon, I hope. Yes. All the best with everyone to make stuff right this month. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.